great pleasure to welcome today one of the uh, really prominent uh, European scientists in the domain of infant development and infant cognitive development, which is the topic of the seminar uh, this year, Agnes Kovacs, who came especially from uh, Budapest uh, to tell us about her studies. She is a specialist of uh, high-level cognition and especially social cognition in infants, and I'm sure she will tell us she was one of the most uh, uh, prominent person uh, introducing new experiments, shifting the time at which we think we understand that uh, infants already understand the social sphere and understand the minds of other uh, individuals. So I'm sure you will tell us more about that. Uh, Agnes uh, is uh, special also for us because she is one of the last uh, students of Jacques Meller. Uh, you know that uh, perhaps half of uh, cognitive science in France uh, is due to Jacques Meller, who was uh, my mentor. Uh, my PhD director and your PhD director when he was in Trieste after leaving CNRS at the age of 65, Jacques Meller went to Trieste in Italy and started a new lab there with extraordinary productivity in, with papers in science, uh, nature, a whole series of uh, beautiful work. Uh, this is the occasion to say that you are the author of one of these papers, uh, the first author, and uh, also that you have an ERC grant, which is one of these high level uh, grants from Europe. And since I mentioned Europe, I have one sad thing to say, uh, which is that Agnès and many other cognitive scientists are working in Budapest at the Central European University, l'Université d'Europe Centrale, l'université qui uh, va être fermée par Viktor Orban. Uh, so this university will, be, will have to move to Vienna. Uh, the teaching will start in September in Vienna because uh, it is not possible for this university to stay in the current political context in Europe, in Budapest. It's the first time in many, many, many years that a university is forced inside Europe to leave a European country. And so I think this uh, needed mention here at Collège de France, where we can freely teach whatever we like. Well, uh, I am very sorry that you will have to move your lab. My understanding is that you will teach in Vienna, but keep your lab for a few years in Budapest, but eventually in three or four years have to move it to Vienna. So we are all the more happy to have you speak here today freely about uh, your wonderful work. Thank you, Agnes, for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Stan, for the invitation and for the very nice words. And uh, yes, I do study theory of mind and how we encode different perspectives that other people might think differently from how we think. And uh, this makes, um, um, this being here is a special occasion also for the reason what Stan mentioned, that uh, um, this is a place where the, the freedom of thinking and divergent perspectives were always cherished. However, nowadays in Europe, there are some places where this is not the case. However, I would like to start with a positive note. So science is without borders and uh, uh, wherever, um, um, uh, whatever happens, then science will flourish. And I'm sure that we will also flourish in Vienna or wherever else in the world. But let me start. Um, um, talking about um, um, the emergence of theory of mind in human infants. And I would like to start with uh, defining a little bit what we usually mean by theory of mind abilities. So this refers actually to, uh, to the ability to attribute mental states to other people, like uh, beliefs, goals, intentions, and also to um, be able to uh, understand, predict, and explain their behavior based on these mental states. States. And why is this interesting? This is interesting because um, actually it's not the actual physical reality which can predict 100% human behavior, but it's the representation of one human being or one entity about this reality which will predict her actions. For instance, if I uh, had I now believed that this talk would have taken place in a different building, I would have gone there, although this talk is supposed to uh, be taken place here, and it is taken place here, and there might be a person who is actually at a different building 
building. So why is this especially interesting from a developmental perspective? So there are at least two very good or very interesting reasons. So one reason is that young infants actually have to make complex inferences about something they cannot directly perceive because, of course, mental states are not directly perceivable. We cannot perceive another person's uh, beliefs or another person's goals directly. We have to make inferences about that. That's one interesting point. And the second interesting point from the view of development is actually that uh, um, mental states, uh, in order to compute mental states and to, for instance, to take a different perspective, a young infant has to go beyond the here and now. So she has to abstract from the current reality and encode, for instance, a different perspective or encode a different belief. And let me start by, uh, by telling you how these different perspectives uh, can be important and uh, how we use them in everyday life. So just imagine a very simple situation where you are having coffee with your best friend and what she does, she actually points to the salt and asks for the sugar. So what will you do in this situation? You will have no problem in giving her the sugar and ignoring her pointing. So she actually pointed to the salt, but you ignored that because you know that she actually intended to get the sugar. So you will disconsider her behavior and you will consider what she meant to do and you will consider her false belief that she believed that the salt container actually is the sugar container. And however, I would like to point out that this kind of different perspective does not always have to be conflicting with the reality, like in this salt sugar case, there is a clear conflict. This perspective can simply be different. So for instance, take this example with a, with a small child and the mother. The mother says, oh, look at the dog. Then the child says, waff, waff. Then the mother says, don't pull the dog's ear. Then the child says, no, waff, waff. So what is interesting here that actually the mother and the child take two different perspectives on the dog. They actually use two different terms to refer to the very same entity in the world, the dog. And however, they have no problem in understanding each other. So just another example would be like, if I refer to this dog as dog, you refer to this dog as Sha, or I refer to this dog as uh, Fifi, and because it's my dog, and you take a different perspective, and for you it's just a dog or it's just an animal. So perspectives can be different, can be conflicting, however, what I would like to argue that actually everyday social interactions from very simple situations like crossing the street or playing soccer to very complex social activities like criminal justice require the ability to, eff to efficiently take into account mental states. And uh, I would like to argue also that a special attention to mental state might explain the unique collaborative structure of human societies and also might allow for efficient uh, social learning what is observable and might be uniquely human. Um, but before going on to the experimental studies, let me just uh, put another example just to illustrate what kind of uh, processes and which aspect of this theory of mind abilities I'm interested in and why. So imagine now you are on, on a skiing holiday and uh, you are not this person who performs this wonderful maneuver, but you are actually one of these three people here who are down the hill and uh, taking a break. And um, why I ask you to imagine this, because you are one of the people who's facing the hill and you are watching this event, this maneuver of the skier. However, you notice that this maneuver wasn't successful and he actually fall and he's approaching very fastly you and your group. Okay, however, you also notice that one person in your group, your friend Anne, she's facing you and she's with the back to this event. So what you will do in a, in, in very fast, well, you will compute that since she's looking at you, talking to you, then she does not see the danger, so she's not aware of the danger, so she will not jump to the side, and what you do, you will prepare to, to warn her about the danger. However, if at, if at this very moment Anne actually turns to the danger and looks at the skier, then you will think that, oh, now she has noticed the danger, so now I don't have to do anything because she will do the appropriate behavior, she will jump aside, and you will withdraw your warning behavior. You prepare to warn, but now you will, draw, you will withdraw. 
However, if at this very moment Anne turns back to you and actually she continues speaking about uh, the, um, the meaning of life as if nothing happened, you will realize that although she looked there, she didn't see the danger, she did not realize there is a danger, so we'll again recompute what she knows and how she will behave and you will actually end up in warning her. So why is this interesting? Because in the time of a couple of seconds, you actually computed and recomputed three times what Anne can see, what this means for her, what this means for her behavior. Moreover, you also prepared and recomputed and replanned your own behavior of warning, not warning, warning again. And what is interesting, and eventually you ended up in a behavior, and what is interesting that actually Anne didn't do much. So she was just standing there and looking around and once looked back. So it's not that actually, uh, of course, your behavior is dependent on her behavior, but it's not that it can be, it's completely triggered by that. It's, it's triggered by the inferences you attributed to her about seeing, not seeing, or looking, but not seeing, and so on. And these are the phenomena I'm interested in. And uh, my major question is how we humans, and especially how young children, arrive to make such complex inferences. And in a time of a couple of seconds, you actually compute and recompute what the other people know, see, and what they will do, and you modify your own behavior. However, let me just uh, mention um, uh, a little bit the standard view. So theory of mind uh, uh, investigation started more than 40 years ago. And for more than, or let's say more or less 30 years, it was thought that these abilities are effortful. They are late developing. So children arrive to reason about mental states only about the age after the age of four. It relies heavily on language, and it's mostly for explanatory purposes. So it's mostly to explain other people's behavior. Just to go back to the skiing example, this would mean that you don't do anything um, um, there in the skiing slope, but you wait that the skier hits your friend Anne, and then when the event happened, you will be able to explain that, oh, she was hit because she did not see the danger, so she did not jump aside. However, this is not what happens in real interactions. We do much more than that. And according to the alternative view on theory of mind, and of course this, um, this, uh, the standard view of theory of mind, it was also measured verbally with verbal tasks, both in infants and adults, sorry, in children and adults, and it's also termed as explicit theory of mind. So we, when you are explicitly asked to reason about someone's belief and predict her behavior based on that. However, uh, in the last 10 years, um, more and more research is about this more implicit like of theory of mind, what you do in online interaction, whether you spontaneously compute what the other people see, know, and believe. And it is thought that this might be effortless and spontaneous. It might have an early onset, so it might be even present in infancy. And it, if it's present in infancy, it cannot rely, of course, on language. And you mostly use it for this kind of predictive purposes, too, as in the case of the skiing example. So let's start. Um, before going to the spontaneous or implicit theory of mind and how we can measure it in adults and infants, let me just mention uh, uh, that historically theory of mind was studied with the standard false belief task in which there is a character, in, uh, he hides a target object, a chocolate, in a, in, a, in a green cupboard. Then he goes out to play. And in his absence, the mother actually takes out the chocolate from the green cupboard and puts it in the blue cupboard. And then the child comes back. And um, uh, children are asked where this character, who's called Maxi, will look for his chocolate. And of course, the correct answer is that he will look for his chocolate where he put it and where he believes the chocolate to be, that is, in the green cup cupboard although there's nothing there, although the chocolate is now in the, in the blue cupboard. So you have to disconsider reality and make, um, um, and, uh, and make a guess or answer based on, on, on Max's belief. And what this was found in the, um, uh, in the developmental literature, so if you administer such a task to a, a three, four, five-year-old children, what you find that actually it's only after the age of uh, four when children pass. So these are not, um, this is a meta-analysis by Wellman and colleagues. So, so these are not individual children, but these are many studies. So this includes hundreds of children. And what you can see that there is above chance performance only about, this, this is age in months, so only about four, 40 months or 40 something months, so only around the age of four, they start to answer correctly this question. 
However, and of course, uh, for many years, this has been the, the major task which has been used, and it yielded lots of re results, both in um, uh, developmental and also with special population and also with adults. However, despite re uh, 40 years of re research, we still know quite little about this theory of mind mechanisms and what kind of processes are involved, in, for instance, in such a task. And uh, let me illustrate this with another example. So this is another example where, where you have a, a typical experiment and what you have actually, you have two characters and what I will ask you to do is you, you have a timer here. I will ask you to compute the belief of, of the character and I will ask you to encode when you actually uh, uh, encoded the beliefs. So just remember the time when you computed the false belief of this character, and in the end, you have to tell me this, this number. So these were uh, the events. So the, an, an agent hid an object into one of the boxes. Now the replacement will happen. The other agent will replace the, the object here. And then, of course, the agent will come back, and the typical Typical question is asked, which is the standard false belief question: Where will she look for his, uh, for her, uh, for her object? Okay, so there are several possibilities. So what I asked you to do was actually to to try to encode the false belief of this character. So this is like an explicit theory of mind task. But I also ask you to try to to uh, to to tackle the moment when you perform these computations. And uh, this could be at several moments in time. For instance, you could have computed her belief at the moment of hiding, where she hid the, uh, the, her, her target ob object in the, in, the, in the box. So how many of you have computed the belief here, or you believe that you have computed here? One, two, a couple. Okay, so there are a couple of people who have computed the belief here. Then there could be also another moment in time when you compute the belief, which could be at the replacing, when another character came and replaced the, um, the object. So how many people think that they computed the belief here? One, two, three, four, much more, okay, 10, okay. And of course, then they could be a very last location. And it could be that you just compute the beliefs when the character comes back and you have to make uh, an inference to predict her behavior, to explain her behavior. And it's also possible that you make the computation also here. So how many people think they computed the belief here? Okay, so then. Okay, some people here. Okay, if you are not very sure when you computed the belief, that's, all, that's fine, because it's not that we have direct access to our, our, our computations. And uh, that's actually a question for us researchers as well. So although you know that you have computed the beliefs, you know that she will have a false belief, she will search in the wrong location, it's not that it's very trivial when this computation actually happened. Did it happen here, here, or here? And of course, why is this interesting? Because if you do it only at the very end, and that entails very different computations than if you do it from the very beginning. Because it, there, there can be at least two ways of tracking other people's beliefs. You can just track who sees what, who knows what, and encode these representations, keep them in mind. And then if there is a change, then you sustain this representation or keep them active. You don't update them. This is the one way, and this would be the online or prospective belief tracking. However, what you could also do, you, do, you don't do much, you don't compute beliefs, but you just track the events, and then when he comes back, you start thinking, oops, but now I have to predict his behavior, so what happened? And you go back in memory, you search for the events, you remember what she has seen, where she has put his object, and you retrospectively infer the beliefs. So these are two very different mechanisms. One is online, and it should be more spontaneous. The other could be more effortful. It's triggered by, by the presence of, of Maxi, and it's triggered by making, uh, by, by, for, by making predictions, having to make predictions or explanations. But also, I would like to point out that it heavily relies on, uh, on memory and uh, uh, episodic memory. Because if you haven't computed the belief, then you have to compute it here. You have to recall all the events which happened before. I will come back to this issue in the very end of the talk where we try to investigate these two kinds of theory of mind mechanisms in young children, and you will see how we do that. But before going there, this was just as an example just to see, just to say that there are still many things we want to understand about theory of mind. And what we are mostly interested, or in this talk, what I will mostly talk about is this kind of implicit theory of mind or this spontaneous theory of mind where you are not told to track the belief 
safe uh, of anyone, but the question is, do you nevertheless do it or not? And let me start with, uh, with uh, presenting you a study, not from theory of mind, not from belief tracking, but from perspective tracking. And uh, this is an implicit task. In implicit task, we mean that you have actually, uh, you, do, you are not told to track the perspective of the, or the belief of, of the other agent. You have a secondary task. You have to just reason about the reality. However, the task is designed in such a way that we can measure whether you have tracked the perspective. So let me explain you how it's done here. So here what you have to do, you have to do just, just to make a numerical judgment. You have to say whether the number of dots, which you see here and here, equals to two. And in this case, in both cases, you have to say yes, yes. There are two dots here, there are two dots here. However, what is manipulated is actually that there is an agent, an avatar, who can have an inconsistent perspective with you. So she actually sees only one dot. However, in this case, she can see two dots. And, um, the logic was that if you, have com if you compute her perspective and you sustain it, then this might interfere with your own judgment. So when she sees only one and you have to say two, then this is an interference and you will be slower. And this is what is found actually. It, this is a task with adults and reaction time studies. And this is what it's found, that you are slower in the inconsistent case. Of course, there's, there are many differences between these two layouts. Uh, there are many controls for that, but I won't go into that. I will just tell tell you how we went on about um, uh, designing a task in which we can study this spontaneous belief tracking where you are not told to track someone's belief. However, we can measure whether you have tracked it or not. And uh, we have uh, decided to make an object detection task. So in this object detection task, what you have, you actually, you have a ball, you have an occluder, the ball goes behind an occluder and the occluder falls and you have to press a button if you see the ball behind the occluder. And what is the logic of the task? The logic of the task is that if you believe that the ball should be here, then you should be fast because you have a clear expectation compared to the, to the condition where, where the ball is not there. You, you see the ball leaving from there. So why is this um, interesting? Because we can apply this task in uh, introducing an agent who actually has a different perspective or a different belief, of, belief about this ball. So what we compare is actually is the following. So we introduce an agent who is in this case is a smurf who sees a ball hiding. Then he sees the ball staying. However, then the smurf leaves the scene. And in his absence, the ball leaves the scene. And in the outcome, you see the ball. So what is crucial here, so this is an object detection task. You have to press a button for the ball. So the logic is here that if you just go by your own beliefs or your own representations about the reality, you have just seen the ball leaving the scene here. So you should be slow in detecting the ball here. However, if you have computed that he believes the ball is here, because the ball left in his absence and you sustain this representation, then this representation might actually speed up your representation when you find the ball there. And how do we measure this? Well, we compare this with a true belief case where this agent actually sees the ball leaving. So you don't have to sustain the representation that he believes that the ball is behind the occluder and you have the same outcome. So here, I would like to point out that if you go by your own representation, in both cases, you see the ball leaving. So you should be slow in both cases. However, only in the false beliefs, you could be faster if you computed uh, automatically or spontaneously the belief of the other agent. And this is actually what we find, that compared to the true belief case, you are much faster in the false belief case. So, and this we take as indirect evidence for computing the representation of this agent, that he believes the ball is behind the, the scene, and for evidence that this representation, which you sustain for another agent, actually affects your own reaction time. So this is what we have done with adults. And since then, there are many other studies involving different characters. So this is Boss and uh, finding very similar studies. And again, this difference between the true belief and the false belief, so the priming by the other's belief. And of course, you can also um, uh, tackle such effects not only in reaction time, but also in, in eye gaze trajectories or in motion trajectories. So let me just explain you. This is a study by Dana Schneider and her group. So this is like a standard false belief task when there are two locations. And this is where the target object is. However, this agent believes that the object is here. So this is the empty box, but also the belief box. And this is the, where the ball is. And your task is not to track the belief of this character, but your task is just to say where the ball is. So you have to point here. 
And what they find, however, that in the false belief case, you tend to look more to this empty box, and this was taken as an evidence that you have computed her belief spontaneously, although it's irrelevant for your task. You don't have to do it, but you nevertheless you have did it because your eyes go more to the empty box in the false belief condition compared to the, to, the, to the true belief condition. When you know that the object is here, and she knows as well that the object is here, you look very little to the empty box. However, when she has a false belief, you look more to the empty box. And this uh, similar effect can be found also in, in motion trajectories when you have to take a cursor and point to them and, uh, and bring it to the, to the box and click on it. You see a deviation, not only by your eyes, that your eyes are attracted by the false belief of the character, but also your cursor is attracted, your motion traje trajectories are deviated by that. But let me go on and, um, and tell you how we uh, went on studying this question with infants. Uh, we, in infants, we use a violation of expectation paradigm, so we don't use reaction time, and the violation of expectation paradigm is very simple. So if the infant sees something which is unexpected, for instance, this pointer going through my hand, this is very unexpected if the infant knows uh, things about uh, solid objects and uh, uh, physical laws. However, uh, and we compare this event when the infant sees the, this pointer stopping at my hand, so this is a normal event. So we show two events, one which should be surprising if the infant make some computations, and the other which should be not surprising. And they should be longer, of course, if they are surprised, if they see something which is unexpected. So this is the logic of the violation of expectation paradigm. How did we apply this to to infants, so we use the very same movies which we show to adults, and again, the logic is very similar to adults, except that the outcome is a bit different. So the, the, the Smurf sees the ball going behind the occluder, he believes the ball to be there, however, you as an infant, you see that the ball leaves. So if you go, and then in the end, what you see as an infant, you see that there's nothing behind the screen. So this is, if you take your own perspective as an infant, this should not be surprising because you just seen the ball leaving, there's no ball there, it should be all fine. However, if you encode that he believes the ball to be here because he has seen it going here and he didn't see it going out because he was not present when the ball left, then if you compute this belief, again, you can show surprise on the behalf of Smurf in this case, but not in the true belief case when he himself also sees the ball going out so you don't need to sustain a belief you have tracked for the Smurf, so it won't affect your, your looking time. And this is actually what we find. That So again, the logic is the same. If you just compute your own representation, in both cases, the ball shouldn't be there, and it's not there. So you should not be surprised by either outcome. However, you, sh you can be surprised only in the false belief condition, only if you have encoded the belief of the Smurf. And this is just um, uh, an example of the baby where you see the event, so the Smurf sees the ball behind the occluder, so here is when you encode possibly the belief. And then the ball, you see that the ball leaves, and then the Smurf comes back, and the screen falls, and you find an event which is congruent with your own belief, but is not congruent with the belief you might have computed for the Smurf, and we measure how long the infant looks at the screen. Okay, but you might say, of course, the, these two scenes, a true belief and the false belief, they are very, very different. They involve different events. So there might be that this, uh, this, um, this is due not to uh, the effect what we found is due to low level differences and not to belief computation. And one control which we have done is the following. So we show exactly the two events. However, we show no outcome, so the screen never falls, so we never reveal whether the outcome is congruent or not with the Smurf's belief or your own belief. However, the logic was here that if, you, if you, the baby's looking is due to, to the, to the low-level uh, features, which uh, are, are the differences between the two conditions, then they should show the same differences. However, if it's due to belief computation, then we should find no difference between the two conditions because the beliefs of no one were violated, neither the beliefs you attributed to the, to the character nor your own belief. And this is what we find, that in this case, in the control, when you see no outcome, 
outcome, so you cannot match this outcome with any of the computed representations, we find no difference between the two conditions. So we concluded that it's not due to these low level differences between the movies. And there are many other studies uh, in, uh, in the infant literature which use it, violation of expectation paradigm in more standard false belief tasks with two locations. But let me just explain one where they don't, they use a different measurement, which is anticipation. So if you have a false belief, for instance, if this character believes there's an object here, you will predict that she will reach here. If she, this is what she does, if she puts an object here, then she reaches here. Then at next time, when, when, you, when you see the windows, for instance, uh, uh, lighting up, which signals the reaching or precede the reaching, you will already look uh, to, to where you believe she will reach before she has reached. So this is what it, it's measured in this task. So for instance, she has a false belief that the object is here. And if you computed this false belief, when there is a signal for reaching, but the reaching did not happen, you might already look here. And this is what they find in the, that infants already look at this location based on her false belief. So this was also taken as evidence for, for computing and predicting others' behavior based on false beliefs. There are also many other studies using more active behavior like searching or hiding or helping behavior or pointing behavior, which I won't go into it, but um, I will go into a searching task in a second. But let me just ask, um, uh, of course, the first thing uh, which comes to one's mind, yes, but there are all these studies, but could we explain infant's performance with some kind of low-level accounts and uh, maybe infants are doing something else, they are encoding uh, something else, they are not attributing beliefs. And how can we uh, uh, address this question? And recently there were also studies with, uh, with great apes in uh, this kind of anticipation task, which show that great apes also show eye gaze anticipation, anticipating others' actions based on, uh, on, um, on someone's false belief. However, um, let me just point out one major criticism which was um, made for many infant studies and um, it's possible, so it was claimed that actually infants do not compute beliefs or do not track beliefs, but what they do, they simply encode three-way association between an agent, a location, and an object. So they encode that the agent and this object and this location, they encode it somehow, they associate it, and when they see the agent again, they retrieve this association, this picture, and they make a, a response based on this picture, and you don't need to encode beliefs or you don't need to attribute um, uh, mental state. So let me tell you a very simple study where we try to exclude this three-way association, and this is what we do. So this is an uh, invisible hiding event where there are two experimenters and two boxes. And what happens here, there is one experimenter who hides one object in one of these two boxes. However, you don't see in which one, so it's an invisible hiding event. So here you can have an association between the agent and the object, however, not between the location because you have no idea where the object is. Okay, then uh, importantly, this agent who has hidden the object, she leaves the scene and the second agent reveals the location of the object. So now you don't have the agent, but you have the relation between the location of the object. So you can form another association, but not the association before, between all three of them. However, we introduced a further twist, and this agent actually rehid this object. So now you have exactly, again, no idea where this object is. And what we do, we then let the infant searching. So now you might wonder, but yes, yes, but why is this a false belief task? Or what, what is this task about? Because the infant has no idea where the object is. The object can be here or here. So the infant will search definitely 50-50. So what do you measure here? Yes, you can say that. However, our reasoning was that if the baby has computed a belief for this person that she has hidden the object somewhere, where you don't know where, but you discover later where, and you can fill in this content to her belief, so you can, here you can compute that she actually believes that the object is still here because she has put here, and if you sustain this belief because she might come back, then your behavior might be primed towards this location, which we call the belief location. And this was the logic of our study. This is again an implicit belief belief tracking task where the child has to actually find the object, but we want to study this implicit effect where there is a possibly sustained representation affects your behavior. And let me show you how the task goes. So there is the hiding, so she has hidden it somewhere, you don't know where, now she, she leaves. 
Now she tells you where the object is, so now you can fill in the content of her beliefs. You can fill in, you can encode that she, the first agent, believes the object to be here. Then, however, there is a rehiding, and you have no idea where the object is. And what we measure whether infants will be biased to go to this location. And actually, this is the infant, and this infant happened to, to do that. Of course, now you might think, yes, but there can be many other explanations why the infant goes to this location. For instance, this is also the location where this infant has last seen the object. And this is true. However, we have a very good control for that, which is the true belief condition. The true belief condition is, is exactly like the false belief, except that the first agent never leaves the room. So she stands here behind the, 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 the second agent, and she watches the events. So why is this important, this true belief condition? It's important because everything is the same. This object is revealed here. However, you don't need, in the true belief condition, since you see that she sees the rehiding, you don't have to sustain this location as her uh, belief location. So you don't have to encode that she believes that the object is here, because since she has seen the rehiding, she has no reasons to believe that. So although you have no idea what she believes now, but this location does not have to be sustained in the true belief. OK, and um, this, this we use as a control. So in the true belief, we predict that you will, you will go 50-50. Of course, if you just go by the, where you see, have seen the object um, last, you will go in the true belief. And in the, both, in the false belief, in both cases, you will go to this location. However, this is not what we find. What we find is exactly that uh, in the false, only in the false belief you go to this location. In the true belief, you are chance. So this is the true belief. This is the false belief. And we have a second experiment we wanted to destroy even more these possible freeway associations. So what we did, we exchanged the toy. So when the second agent did the rehiding, she took out this toy which the first agent hid, and she put it in a bag, and she introduced a new toy. So now the child has to search for a new toy. And however, we find the same effects. So you might wonder, but why you find the same effect with the new toy? Well, because it's not related to the toy, the belief of the other person. So the other person, whenever this toy disappears or, or whatever happens, this person, if she comes back, will still have a false belief that the first toy is in this box. And this is what you sustain. And this is what affects, actually, the children's behavior. Although the toy cannot be here, cannot dis can disappear, many things can happen, but you seem to sustain this belief. Belief. OK, so let me quickly um, um, turn the page and uh, show you more arguments why we should assume that infants actually compute beliefs and not uh, perform some other low-level computations. So one very convincing evidence comes from neuroscience. So if we find that two populations, for instance, infants and adults, use the same brain networks to uh, to do some computation which are thought to be specific to, to dead brain networks, then we have no reasons to say that they do something different, that infants do uh, low-level association, adults do some high-level mental computations. We have to say that either they both do some low-level things or either they both do some high-level things. And um, so this is a study by Daniel Hyde and his uh, collaborators. And what they do, they do a false belief, a true belief, and uh, another control condition. And this is brain image. This is a near infrared spectroscopy, and they study infants and adults. And what they find is actually that the, the right TPJ, the very same reason which is also found with fMRI studies to be specific to theory of mind, to explicit theory of mind reasoning in adults, seem to be active also in this kind of implicit task when you are just shown events and you track the, what is happening. And what they find, that they find higher activation for the false belief condition, both in the adults and in the infants in the very same regions, which would suggest that possibly infants and adults do similar things in such kind of tasks. OK, but then we went on and we tried to ask, so what can be the characteristics of such um, belief representations, how infants might compute such representations, and how such representation might be different from uh, first-person representations? And here are a couple of questions and studies uh, which uh, uh, aim to study these questions. So what we ask, so do infants, for instance, use uh, the same brain networks to perform uh, uh, computations attributed to another person that they, they use 
use for first-person computation? That's one, one question we ask. A second question we ask is, do they use the same principles for their own mind and also they apply that for, another, for other minds? That would be uh, very reasonable things to do. But of course, there also have to be some differences between first-person representations and attributed representation. And this could be related to their format, but I will uh, talk in detail in a second. But let us start with the... Um, with the common networks for computing the content for first person representation and second person or this attributed representation in infants. So we start, we have done a study where we started from an observation in which if you show an object to an infant, to a six month old, and then you occlude this object, then you find um, um, a gamma oscillation which are increased as measured with the EEG. Uh, in the temporal areas which was claimed to be a signature for sustained object representation. So the object is occluded, the baby has, the baby knows it's there, and there is this gamma activation which is, uh, correlates with sustained object representation. However, what we have done, which my former PhD student Dora Kompisch, who is now at University of Copenhagen, is the following. We introduced an agent and we asked the same question. So would, so the agent ate the baby see this, this, uh, this object and then it's occluded and we find very similar uh, gamma oscillation which indicates sustained object representation. But this is not the trick. The trick is the following. So what happens when this object is actually occluded only from the agent but not from the infant? So if the baby uses the same networks to compute the perspective of this agent and to, to compute that this person does not see the object but she has to sustain a representation for this, then we might find similar um, gamma oscillations in both cases. And this is what we actually find. So whether the object is occluded from the infant or only from the agent, we find similar oscillation which points to common neural networks for computing the content of attributed representation and first-person representation. Then, going to the principles, so, of course, um, uh, the human mind is subject to some very old principles which were formulated many, many years ago. So, one principle is that one cannot think A and not A at the same time. So, I cannot think that my cat is on the, on the sofa and on the mat at the same time. I either think one or the other. And uh, with Olivier Mascaro, who is my former collaborator now at the University of Lyon, we have, um, uh, he actually had the idea that this should also apply not only to our own mind and to first-person computation, and it's not only that it's inbuilt in our object tracking system and it's like this that the system works, but this should be a principle which we should actually apply also to other minds. So we should assume that someone cannot believe A and not A at the same time. And this is what we try to test in the following way with 15 months old infants. So this is a communication task where there is an agent who hides an object, then she points at one location and she says, oh, it's here. And then, however, she points very fast after that, she points to another location and then she says, it's here. So if Stan asks me, where are my glasses? And I say, oh, they are here. And then I say, oh no, they are there. Stan will assume that I was wrong and I assume that and I updated my beliefs and he will actually go there and search for, for his glasses because he will assume that I don't believe that the glasses are actually in two places but I had an initial guess which uh, I updated and I realized it's wrong and he will follow my second pointing or my second indication. And the question is whether infants assume that this is also what, uh, what uh, other people do and that this is how other people's minds work and also communication is congruent with that. And if so, then in this case, they should follow the second pointing because they update that she was wrong, probably wrong here, and she realized that the object is here or she updated her belief. And this we compare with a situation where there are two agents who do this contradictory pointing. So of course, if I point to two different locations indicating the same object, there is a contradiction. But if two people point, then there is no contradiction because I can believe this is here, you can believe it's there. Whom do you trust? We don't know. If you have no reason to trust one or the other, you should go random. And actually, this is what we find. So infants, when there are two informants giving contradictory information, they go random. However, when there's one informant, and they assume that this person has updated her beliefs and they follow the second one. So they assume that she cannot think both, she just think the second because of, uh, of the updating. Okay, 
So after all these commonalities using common principles, using networks which compute content for both first person and attributed representation, there can be also uh, the question asked, uh, okay, but there must be some differences between the representation I attribute to another person and my own representation because I, I, I act, of course, most of the time based on my own representation. And one claim um, which is out there in the literature since long that uh, this kind of attributed representation might have a propositional format. Um, but if this is true, how can we study this? How can we study propositional representation in infants where it's very difficult? And we haven't found a very direct way to study this, so I will show you an indirect way. However, if you have any ideas for a direct way to study this question, please let me know. So let me t tell you how we start, how we, what is the indirect evidence we have and how we started to, to investigate this. So the indirect way is uh, very simple, but a little bit contorted. So if we find that a baby can attribute a content which can only be propositional, then we have to assume that this attributed or the format, it, it, it's probably propositional, or it's a format which can encompass this propositional representation. So this is the, the logic of the study. But let me tell you where we started from. So we started from an observation in the infant literature that infants seem to be sensitive to presence but not to the absence of objects. So for instance, if an infant sees a, a scenario like this, that there is a car which goes behind an occluder and then you find the car, there is, this is the expected scenario, so this should be what the baby expects. However, the baby should be surprised when you see the car which exits the scene and then you find the car behind the scene, right? The baby should be surprised because there should be nothing there. However, this is not what is found in the literature. Six months old babies, they are not surprised. And it was claimed that they do not encode absence. But why they do not encode absence? So how could absence be encoded? So we could think of two ways of encoding absence. Of course, there might be more, but these are two ways which we came up. One is the easy way through the object file system. And the other is the hard way via propositionally via negation. So what is the easy way? The easy way is just you assign an object uh, file or an object index a la, a la Kahneman or Tversky or Pilishin, which is like a pointer, like an attentional pointer to the car. And when he goes out of the screen, you move this pointer and it goes, it fades out because it's not in your attention anymore. So you move this pointer here somewhere and it fades out. That's the easy way and you use the object file system. However, propositionally, if you encoded, then you use a proposition and you encode it that there is no car behind the, the occluder. What babies probably do, they use this way, and this is why, which, and it was claimed that they do not encode absence actually, but they encode presence somewhere else which fades out. But how do we use this and why is this interesting for us? Because there is a very special case of, uh, of, uh, of absence which is ceased existence. Let me show you again if you haven't noticed. So there was a car here which now disappeared. So why is this interesting? Because, of course, you can encode it the easy way. However, if you do it the easy way, then the object file is deleted. So there's nothing left there in your representational system. If you do it the hard way via negation, then you have this propositional representation. So in one case, in this case, you have nothing, and here you have a representation. And why is this interesting? Because if we introduce a social situation, so this agent witnesses this uh, ceased existence event, and you have to attribute this ceased existence to him, then the problem is that if you deleted the object file, there's nothing left for you to attribute to this agent. Is it clear why? Because the object file was actually deleted. So in, in, your, in your cognitive system, there's nothing, a big zero. So you cannot attribute anything to this agent. So if we find evidence that you attribute, or a young baby attributes an, a representation about C's existence to this, uh, to this agent, then that has to be propositional. And this is how we wanted to study whether this belief reasoning is propositional or not. We had this very indirect way, which is, uh, I agree, it's not very trivial and I hope I managed to explain it. Okay, so the events are very simple. So the object comes out, dissolves, the, the Smurf sees it, then he leaves the scene, and in his absence, another object comes back, and then the screen falls and the object is there. So again, this is the false belief condition, where if you go by your own representation, you shouldn't be surprised, because you have seen a ball coming back, you find a ball. This is all congruent with your own representation. However, you should be surprised only if you have 
coded that he believes that the object is not there and uh, you attributed this C's existence via propositional representations to this other agent. And of course, we compare this with the true belief case where the Smurf is there, sees the object going out, coming back, and then there's nothing surprising. And we predicted that you should be surprised in this case, but not in this case, of course. But again, as, in, as always, if you just go by your own representation, in both cases, the ball comes back, so you shouldn't be surprised. And what we find, we find evidence that actually infants, these are 12 months infants, have encoded uh, uh, and have attributed the representation about C's existence to this Smurf, possibly via propositional representations, because otherwise, if you just delete the object file, there's nothing to be attributed, so we wouldn't see this evidence um, uh, here. So this is the convoluted or very indirect evidence what we have. Of course, we also have very many controls for this, where we just have simply an inanimate object and we don't find the, the, the same effects. But um, let me, can I take uh, three more minutes? Yeah, I want to explain just one more study related to um, to this question of uh, what kind of theorem of mind mechanism might be involved and how can we study them differently. So. So let me uh, just go back to this, um, to this question of timing that we don't know when the belief is computed and that it, this involves radically different mechanism, this online tracking where you accumulate evidence slowly by slowly or this retrospective thing when you don't compute much but you infer everything backwards and you retrieve all the events. And what we wanted to ask, we assume that possibly young infants do this online tracking because if they do this retrospective uh, belief computation, this seems much more difficult because you need to rely on episodic memory and you need to make much more complex inferences. So this was our hypothesis, but how can we investigate that? And we also wanted to ask another question. So can young children perform updates very flexibly? So if I compute that Stan has a false belief, can I... And then I realized something that this is actually, it has to be a true belief. Can I update this flexibly all the other way around? And let me explain you how we did this. So this is a, a very simple task, which is, uh, involves an agent, a child, and two boxes and two objects. And there are two, two objects hidden in these two locations, and both are new objects. And then this person puts on some sunglasses, and then the second agent actually exchanges the location of th these two objects. And then what happens is actually there is a referential pointing and the agent says, give me this object. And what we measure is what the child gives. So this task up to now was developed by Southgate and collaborator. And what they find that infants can do this based on true beliefs and false beliefs. So this is a little bit like the salt scenario that I point to the salt asking for the sugar and you will give me the sugar. However, we introduced a twist here. As you see here, so assuming this scenario is a true belief scenario because she puts, the, puts on the sunglasses, so sunglasses are usually transparent, so you compute that she probably sees what is happening here. However, so she has a true belief, and then if she has a true belief, then in this case you should follow pointing. However, if the child later on in her absence discovers that these sunglasses are actually opaque, then what she has to go, what she has to do, she has to go back in time to realize what happened before, to realize that when the exchange took place, she had the sunglasses on, and to recompute her true belief into a false belief. And now, if she has a false belief, when she points here, then she probably means the other object, so then you should perform this other behavior, you should go to the, to the, uh, to the other container. And this is what we wanted to measure. So we wanted to measure, once you compute a belief, how flexible you are as a child to revise this belief based on very minimal information, because uh, remember here, the, neither of the agents are present, it's only the infant and the sunglasses. So is this enough to go back in time and recompute what happens? and realize that she has a false belief or not. And we uh, asked this studying uh, uh, 36 months old and 18 months old infants, and what we find that three-year-old uh, children, they do revise this without any problem. So this is the opaque condition when the child discovers that the sunglasses are opaque. 
and what they it's seemingly and they actually give uh, when when you do the pointing they go to the other box so they realize that you had a false belief because the the sunglasses were opaque and they give you the the objects from the other box and not from the box you pointed at of course in the true belief what they do they just follow the pointing so they give you the 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 object from from the pointing box and however, this is not what um, 18 months old do. So 18 months old infants, what they do in both conditions, whether they discover the sunglasses are opaque or they stay transparent, what they do, they just follow the pointing. They just go behave as if the, it was a true belief condition. So we don't find evidence that they can go back in time and they can make these very complex inferences. However, this is, this is not to say that they cannot track false beliefs because if we show them the sunglasses from the very beginning and they know that they are opaque, they can do this online tracking. Then they can compute the false belief. And this is what we find in this condition. So in the opaque condition, when from the beginning they know that this is a false belief condition, they do give the agent the other object and not the one she pointed at. So they behave as they should in a false belief condition. What they have problem with is actually with, with this update in which they have to use episodic memories to encode, to recompute uh, the already computed beliefs. So uh, this is just, since I'm out of time, this is just a general summary. So um, these were a series of studies where we tried to investigate this spontaneous belief tracking in infants and adults. We tried to understand what kind of processes might underlie this, what kind of mechanisms are involved. Uh, we tried to disentangle uh, differences between online uh, belief tracking and retrospective belief tracking. We tried to understand how the representations uh, of the first person representation and attributed representations are different or similar regarding their content, the underlying principles or their format. And of course, there are many questions one can ask regarding why infants go beyond here and now, why they start encoding, encoding multiple perspectives. Do they start doing it first in the social environment and they also do it in other, for other purposes, for instance, for planning. You also need multiple perspectives representing multiple alternatives. Can we find this uh, very early on in other other domains. Uh, of course, there are many other questions, but um, I think I should stop here and thank you very much.